Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, as uh, the slide shows, I come. Uh, so, at UCLA, we have the Center Sense. Actually, Aman's PhD work and all was as part of that. It's an NSF center focused exclusively on sensing technologies. And kind of over the years, we sort of we started out with a lot of work in environmental sensing and those kind of things. And lately, I guess a lot of interest has moved sort of indoors and personal, and sort of this effort is one of those uh, where basically we are looking at uh, resource consumption. By resource, I mean uh, electricity, gas, water, these kind of things uh, inside buildings. And uh, sort of it's ongoing work, so some of, some of the things I'm talking about are still kind of a bit more in the preliminary phases. So our focus in this is really residential and commercial buildings, office buildings, those kind of things, as opposed to industrial stuff. And the reason simply is that, uh, as this slide shows, a lot of um, resources do go towards it. I mean, some of it was kind of eye-opening for me because I always hear, oh, data centers are growing and all, but actually the big chunk is still these regular buildings. And um, uh, be it sort of electricity, gas, water, less so. The big consumption of water in this country is purely agriculture. Uh, but non-agricultural use, again, big chunk comes from here. Um, so uh, idea being that I mean, even moderate improvement in the sector can sort of be extremely beneficial. And motivations for this sort of obviously come from many directions. There are a lot of money um, which goes into it. Um, uh, we pay as our utility bills. It's just it's kind of distributed among millions of us, so uh, we don't kind of realize it. Uh, enormous shortage, particularly water in California, in Southern California. Right now, we are going through this 15% mandatory reduction, and the price doubles once you ex exceed that lower threshold. So, uh, parts of the even the Western world have uh, sort of huge shortages. And I mean, if you look at this water poverty index map. I mean, it's pretty severe uh, elsewhere in the world. The other interesting thing which I sort of realized as we started working into it, this kind of deep connection between water and electricity. Um, supplying water takes energy, uh, particularly drinkable water, and huge amounts of it. And the flip side also, making energy, at least in this country, consumes a lot of water. And uh, in fact, the water used to produce energy accounts for roughly 40% of uh, the residential building water usage. So it's a big chunk. And it's mostly coming from evaporative losses in uh, uh, power plants. So enough uh, sort of uh, reasons that uh, saving, uh, saving in um, sort of uh, the resources, broadly speaking, um, electricity, water, gas would be beneficial. So what do people do? Well, there are sort of three kind of things that happen. Uh, you try to replace older, less efficient uh, appliances, devices, whatnot with um, newer technology. Uh, problem always occurs is that uh, a lot of it is kind of based upon spec sheets and all, very little understanding of how these things actually end up uh, saving in real life. Uh, so for example, a study at um, uh, residence halls, they replaced um, uh, manual flush toilets by auto flush toilets, except as a consequence of that, the flush per person actually went up. Uh, so no, it's not necessary that a technology which promises to save will necessarily be beneficial uh, from this regard. Uh, detect and repair, a uh, lot of uh, problems because of, in case of water leakage, in case of energy, just uh, bad insulation, those kind of problems. Uh, sort of uh, duct work not being in shape, things like that. And finally, uh, the one which sort of motivated us quite a bit was uh, modifying behavior, modifying behavior of the uh, occupants in the building. Because again, a lot of studies and a variety of contexts have shown that it does promise sort of uh, big, big gains to be there. So uh, across all of these, the common thread which runs is that it's hard to say whether any given measure would work. I mean, in LA area, we are kind of used to hearing these ads, brush 
whatever, two minutes only and uh, take shorter showers and stuff like that. Unclear whether utilities are directing their incentives in the right way, uh, incentives for all sort of things, replacing your pool motor by uh, multi-speed motor, things like that. But I think most of these things are coming from aggregate statistics and not being targeted properly. So the common, um, uh, I guess, what technology can provide here and which helps all these three classes of measures are, is providing just this insight into which one of these measures would work, where does the resources go, and there's sort of several questions. How much is being consumed? Where is it being consumed? When is it being consumed? By whom is it being consumed? And what activities? So all of these questions um, sort of help um, uh, partly just providing that insight to users, uh, that behavior modification, partly to target incentives and invest in the right type of measures. So what this talk really is about is what can we do from a technology perspective uh, for that final question. By the way, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions along the way. Um, so uh, what exists? Well, we have our utility bills, obviously. M most of the country is like that, and uh, you get sort of monthly, maybe bi-monthly uh, snapshots, and essentially a whole building uh, type of statistics. So it's pretty coarse-grained um, uh, uh, kind of technology. There are obviously smart meters kind of things emerging, and uh, many utilities are deploying them. Uh, most of the time, the data is not accessible to the building owners. Uh, there are uh, technologies where, as an end user, you can install these things. At my home, I have actually both these things on the right-hand side deployed. This bottom one basically just hooks up to any meter and mo monitors that rotating disk, and thereby kind of reaches its purely sort of end user installable. The one up there basically requires these current sensors to be installed inside the panel. A uh, reasonably handy homeowner can do it, but it's probably not something that everyone can. And uh, these things come pretty close to being accurate, a couple of percentage kind of uh, numbers. Uh, and a finer spatial granularity, I'm sure many of you would have seen at least these kind of devices at Home Depot and all, which basically let you measure power at an outlet level. And in some cases, even read it, um, feed it to your uh, computers and all. Uh, problem usually in these things is A, they work only for plug-in devices. A vast majority of energy at our home goes into devices which are not plugged into outlets. They are hardwired into the electrical infrastructure, so no easy access um, uh, to put these devices. And also, they're aesthetically ugly. I mean, you have, I mean, imagine every outlet having this kind of box sort of sitting. So just sort of doesn't work out beyond pilot studies kind of things. On the water side, the story is kind of similar. There are smart water meters, which are even rarer uh, in terms of uh, utility installations. There are ultrasound-based, non-intrusive uh, sensing. They basically measure the fluid flow. Uh, they are pretty costly, anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 bucks, so not really something you would do at a per outlet level, but certainly an okay technology for a whole building kind of space. But, uh, what's the? Uh, ultrasound, so the one which you see up there, um, they basically measure the fluid flow. Um, so they inject sound at one end. And so. Both, both. Uh, some of these things work only with liquid which has particulate matter in it. They are targeted at industrial processes. A subset of them also work with sort of your fresh water. So, and they work pretty well, easy to install. None of them have network interfaces currently, unlike things on the electrical side. And then there are stuff which are supposed to be hooked up to your faucets and all, and you run into the aesthetic issue. Um, you're not going to have these kind of things hooked up to your faucet on your sink and all. So uh, they're good for sort of periodic water audits and specialized situations, but not really something that uh, you can deploy uh, and use regularly. So uh, uh, it, at some level, the state currently is the following, that if it's on the electrical side, uh, you need to measure both current and voltage because um, uh, in case of partially inductive loads, you have to also take into account their phase difference. And therefore, pretty much you have to have some sort of inline sensing capability. That is, um, you have to uh, either uh, uh, sort of wrap something around the cable 
or uh, which basically means opening up the conduit, uh, for example, or you, uh, you would have device, the plug-in devices that sort of I shown. On the water flow side, pretty much um, uh, either the technology, the cheaper ones, are uh, require inline installation, plumber. The technology is very simple. You can buy these flow meters, which basically have a rotating magnetic turbine inside. When the water flows, that thing spins, and then externally from outside the pipe, you can basically get the magnetic pulses. So simple technology, but then you have to pay the plumber to kind of install that, and that turns out to be pretty expensive. And the other side is indeed those uh, ultrasonic sensors that I mentioned. Uh, bottom line is that currently uh, the per metering point cost is well in excess of a thousand bucks, and which pretty much means that yeah, you can you do whole building kind of stuff. In some places, multi-tenant buildings they have maybe metering point for every couple of floors kind of things, but that's pretty much where you stop. Um, getting into sort of finer spatial granularity is just uh, economically not easy right now. So. Uh, what we have been doing is, and this is actually a thread which has been running in sort of some subset of the community lately, which is non-intrusive resource monitoring. Uh, we don't, uh, to the extent we can, we don't want to put anything in line in the electrical or the gas or the water infrastructure. And uh, key observation is that there are always side effects of these resources. So when electricity, when we use an electrical appliance, well, when the current flows, there's a magnetic field being induced, light in case of lamps, sound in case of certain type of appliances, airflow in case of fans. So there are these uh, physical signatures which have at least some correlation with the resource consumption. We don't know what it is, but I mean, at, at an intuitive level there is. In case of water, water vibrates, uh, wa wa water flow makes the pipes vibrate. Um, you have sound in case of flushing. Uh, so there are, again, these signatures available. So um, what we started out with, can we somehow make use of these signatures and then have relatively simple sensors, kind of which that sensor networking community has been playing with quite a bit and sort of aggregate this data somehow and get accurate, fine-grained um, information. So uh, conceptually then in case of uh, uh, power, so con what we call as indirect sensing basically boils down to that somewhere either near the appliance or the cable leading to it or the conduit out there, we basically um, capture some of these uh, extraneous signals, magnetic, light, sound, these are the ones that we have played with, but you can imagine other. And then sort of algorithmically try to recover the precise rate of resource consumption. Same thing with water. Um, instead of ultrasound or inline kind of things, uh, could we, we sort of focused on vibration, uh, could we get vibration to work again sort of um, uh, by learning its relationship at some level. So over the next few slides, uh, what I'm going to do is to kind of show um, um, how some of these signatures work out in practice. So let's take magnetic field. Uh, so this is a very simple sort of lab scale uh, experiment in the slide where we just put a magnetic sensor next to a cord. Okay? Uh, so the cord obviously has the live, the neutral and the ground wire sort of going through it. And we look at the magnetic field. Uh, this actually works very nicely even like the wires leading to the switches in the wall and you just put a magnetic sensor on top of the wall. It works fine. Um, so you see some signature coming it out here. Um, in this case, it turns out, I mean, if you go into the physics behind it, that basically the, uh, uh, if, if we do a standard deviation uh, on this, then sort of we get something which, barring a scale and a offset factor is basically very much the true power consumption. So uh, if we can learn that relationship, what that scale and offset is, then uh, we are in shape. Now, obviously, this depends on every different appliance or device that parameters are going to be different. So the trick is how, how do you learn those? So conceptually then, uh, the relationship between this X sort of relate, uh, just measuring the um, uh, magnetic field kind of boils down to something like this. Alpha and beta are the two sort of calibration parameters. And the S in this case is the standard deviation of the signal that we are doing. And works beautifully for a whole bunch of other things. This is a hot air gun, this is a massage chair, and you kind of see uh, at least it mimicking uh, that trend in power consumption, ground truth very nicely. Now, many appliances are even simpler. They usually have a few constant 
power consumption states like let us take our light bulbs up here they are on off and in the on state they have a uh, power consumption if we learn then all we really need to detect is when they are on off take a fan uh, three speeds um, uh, take a fridge uh, compressor on off uh, Previous slide? Uh, yeah. Does it also work for three phase uh, electricity? We have tried it only in uh, where the appliance itself is a single phase or I guess pseudo, pseudo two phase, whatever the right term for it is. So uh, we have not tried it with three phase. Okay. So this I don't know. Pardon me? This is not polytech. This is not, this is just basically it's a mutual, inductance. It's a mutual inductance. Uh, there are Hall effect based sensors which you can buy uh, and so some of those devices I had on a previous slide internally some of them directly measure using uh, and, uh, and some of them are using Hall effect there. Yeah. So uh, there are other devices which are as I said simpler, uh, they have a small number of discrete states and some signature like light level and acoustic level kind of differs across those states. So if I am willing to just detect which state you are in then my job is even simpler and uh, if somehow I learn or know uh, what the power consumption is in each one of those states then kind of uh, the power estimation thing sort of becomes relatively straightforward. So this is an example of a fridge where um, so few things happen compressor kicks on off um, that is one thing and your um, uh, light uh, inside the fridge comes on off. Okay, so that's a couple of things. The other thing is, as the thermostat setting is changed, then in the active mode, the power level will change. So you probably need a recalibration. But people don't go around changing the thermostat every so often. This is sort of a relatively rare event. So as long as we can detect and learn it, we are fine. So uh, what you see out here is compressor was off, and then the door opened, the lamp came on. Here the compressor was on, there is a power transient and then while the compressor was on the door was open. So you kind of see the superposition of these things. Um, excuse me. Okay, so this is uh, sound level um, on a refrigerator and uh, sort of uh, uh, when the compressor comes on off with sort of we have the sensor sitting inside the fridge you kind of see the um, uh, sort of at least at a state level there is a correlation. I think my animation kind of messed up a little bit. Yeah and this is the same for detecting door open or door opening closing the light sensor works. So sort of a uh, light and sound sensor inside the fridge does the trick. Uh, in case of lamps lights work great of course you have a problem with uh, making sure that you do not get fooled by the ambient light level. Uh, in case of lights uh, often times I mean like in a room like this you may have a couple of banks of light. So even a single light sensor would work um, you would basically have to make a three way decision nothing on bank one on uh, or both, uh, one bank on both banks on. So for these kind of devices uh, sort of the approach basically boils down to if we can detect which state you are in and we know what is the power consumption in that state then basically uh, um, sensing some sort of indicator variable and sort of combining these three things. So um, a straightforward computation at that stage. Now water, uh, mentioned that earlier, so water is more complicated. Uh, so when water flows uh, essentially sort of from the hydrodynamics of it they basically induce vibrations into the pipe. Uh, and flow rate has some monotonic relationship with the pipe vibration and sort of again um, in the mechanical engineering side of things they have sort of um, detailed models of it and all which work out but we went with a more empirical approach but bottom line is at intuitive level higher the flow rate uh, the more it will vibrate. And again the precise relationship depends upon the particular pipe infrastructure, pipe material, diameter all those kind of things. Uh, so this is just sort of uh, an example of uh, flow rate versus vibration, uh, vibration in this case just being measured using the relatively crappy accelerometer that you have on these modes. So nothing terribly high accuracy or anything, but you see that there is some at least nice looking relationship that does exist. That is for PVC, this is for copper, similar thing holds true, of course the precise numbers are different. 
So um, with some empirical sort of fitting, playing around in MATLAB and all, uh, we found that sort of a equation of this type, uh, no physics justification of this, but it seems to work quite well with pretty much every pipe we have played with in a uh, building kind of setting, three, uh, four calibration parameters and some dependence upon uh, uh, the square root and the cube root of uh, acceleration that we are measuring. In this case, we measure the total accelerometer energy. So we basically just take the three axes and kind of find the overall energy. So uh, again, if we knew these alpha, beta, gamma, delta, our sort of task is done. So the challenge that at some level boils down to is one of calibration. Um, conventionally, um, when you have a sensor and you're trying to make it into reliably measuring something, you kind of go through this uh, typically in an in-factory kind of calibration stage and just make sure that you kind of install it very carefully and all. Um, uh, here sort of our goal was something easy to install, sort of the end user is placing these things around. So we do want the system to le uh, learn these characteristics in situ uh, after sort of su subsequent to deployment. Um, and the key thing that we sort of, the insight that we bring uh, into this part of the work is the following, that at one place in the building, we do have a high reliability reading, and that's your central meter. Uh, and as I showed, sort of, at least in case of electricity, there are very easily and relatively ch cheap sort of things that you can install on the meter to get to within one to two percent accuracy. In case of water, the ultrasound costs are still a little bit high, but they're comparable to what um, if I'm in LA, again, we are allowed to put some meters for non-irrigation usage and all, and the cost of a regular water meter plus install is roughly similar to these ultrasound-based uh, sensors. So the technology is sort of there, certainly affordable at a whole building level uh, kind of setting. So, uh, and I guess the other aspect is that, yeah, we are measuring in one place. The other thing is, in the natural daily life pattern of a building, you would see different permutations of endpoints, appliances, devices coming on and off. And as long as I can detect those on off behavior, then I can use that together with this precise centralized reading to then hope to learn those calibration coefficients over time. So when I start out, I may not know anything, but over some time I would be able to. Uh, if it's always the case that two devices always come on at the same time and always go off at the same time, we will think of them as one. Uh, okay. So, but if it ever happens that they have a pattern of on-off which is not in phase, that is, uh, then we'll detect it and we'll learn that. So you don't detect this as a, as a power state change for the same device. You are able to differentiate between the devices. Uh, we would be able to because we will have um, sensors, these indirect sensors on the two devices. And you can all—I mean—you can always think of it at any arbitrary level of granularity. I mean, some of our work we are doing with residence halls, there all we care about is a room-level granularity. Okay, uh, so to us, the room is an appliance. Okay, in that case. Uh, uh, you can smart meter accuracy in terms of kilowatts. Uh, the lights you're measuring are only 50 watts, but it can never detect differences. Right? For example. Um, the, the, uh, the, at, at the home level, if you look at the quiescent thing, at my home, like for example, I've noticed we hover around a kilowatt, and a light turning on off is very nicely detectable, a single lamp. Okay. Yeah. For very, very low level devices, not what we do is, I mean, this, so we, look, the other reality also is, even with this indirect approach, you're probably not going to instrument everything. So we kind of think of rest of the house as this phantom device whose average characteristics we learn and we just factor that in. So um, uh, typically when you go through sort of a sensor installation kind of thing, um, you install sensors, you collect data, you perform calibration. So you have the ground truth, you're looking at the measurements, um, you will estimate your desired physical variable, in our case, current and water flow rate, check the performance, kind of iterate, uh, sort of reasonably manually intensive process. I mean, that's how you would kind of go around doing this. And what I want to describe is that how um, um, working with 
these kind of non-intrusive sensing modalities together with uh, sort of this intuitive idea that combining uh, sort of that one precise reading that I do have and over time with observations that I am having can I hope to learn these things. And the goal being that then sort of the end user basically can install the sensors, but pretty much sort of algorithmic uh, intelligence takes over and kind of self calibrates the system at that stage. So, exploiting the existing infrastructure, so smart meters are if you are if you have great, if not these devices they basically run in a couple of hundred dollar kind of thing. So, they become adjunct to your meter or your electrical panel and you are getting a whole building kind of thing. Uh, here you do see this is actually uh, from my home. So, we have been collecting data from a couple of residences for a few months now uh, at one second time sample. Uh, so, you see kind of refrigerator activity or uh, a cooking range coming on a bunch of activities going on. Um, water um, we uh, so turns out at least LADWP uh, does not let us mess with their water meter and it is very inconveniently located at the curb uh, near the street. So, we kind of just went with this ultrasound based approach and again low flow we run into problems with this, but uh, your typical flushes and tooth, uh, taking shower and turning the faucet on for filling a uh, cup and all you are able to detect this. So, around this notion then sort of uh, our system we called as viridiscope, virid is green, so uh, green technologies. Um, and so, we have the sensing infrastructure which is distributed, uh, we have centralized monitoring. So, we kind of call that as tier 1 sensors, tier 2 sensors are these indirect sensors and then basically we learn the model, we calibrate and when we kind of fuse these things and essentially try uh, have per endpoint resource consumption. Uh, continual real time low latency. And they are kind of two, uh, we started at water originally and lately we have done electricity. So, I am going to describe results on sort of both of them. Okay, so, uh, going into this calibration, uh, both these networks electrical and water are a tree, multi level tree in general, but they are nevertheless a tree structure. So, um, uh, let us for the moment just stick to kind of a two level tree and you can easily generalize the analysis of that. So, basically your meter reading is going to be the sum of uh, the estimate of resource flow that we have at every end point or if we have intermediate junction point sensors you can kind of modify the equation correspondingly. And that right hand side depends upon kind of sensors we have. I already spoke about them, uh, magnetic had this kind of uh, equation, light uh, sound, this was a vibration. We do permit direct sensing. So, if you have those uh, one of those uh, plug in kind of things there that is easily handleable. And finally, we take everything else to be this phantom device or uh, which is uninstrumented and we try to learn its average uh, consumption rate. So, we have a whole bunch of calibration parameters the alphas, the betas, the rows and all on the right hand side and we have the central metering point. And sort of uh, algorithmically then it boils down to we have to find those values of calibration parameters such that our objective function which is the meter reading minus that uh, symbolic expression for uh, the aggregate gets minimized and uh, there are various ways you kind of up can approach this thing. It is actually relatively simple to do in case of electricity. In case of water there are some additional effects which come into play which sort of complicate this issue. So, let us look at the water one because that is actually the more complicated lot. So, uh, we have so imagine this kind of thing which sort of we have had deployed for a while. So, again central meter where uh, we are using the ultrasound thing uh, currently and we have vibration sensors attached to the various pipe segments. Uh, so, under your sink for example, so at every end point. Some of these are easily accessible, some of them are not and if you have one of those uh, slab foundation houses then you are probably out of luck for uh, many of these things, but uh, in that case this technology does not apply. But, uh, but in most office buildings and all they have uh, sort of nice conduits to access. In many houses you have crawl spaces or things are feeding from the attic, so kind of work from there. So, the calibration problem in this case then boils down to meter reading is the summation of all the flows. The flows corresponding to that funky equation that I had and over time we get multiple 
uh, readings like this, multiple meter readings, each one of them is corresponding to uh, that summation. And essentially, our goal is to solve this set of equations to get those the alpha, alpha, beta, gamma, delta for each of the sensor. Okay, so uh, again, from an optimization perspective, then basically meter reading is equal to that estimate, and as long as we can find this equation, we are done. Well, uh, what we do is we uh, do regression by L1 norm for this particular formulation. This is basically a linear program, so um, easily done. Complication comes, and this is a complication that electrical networks do not have, but water do, pipes cross talk. That is, when I turn faucet on uh, my sink, then the vibration is carried over to other parts of the pipe network also. And so somehow you need to account for that. Uh, in electrical also, there is some of that, if depending upon your sensing modality. If you have heavy appliance coming on, then it can induce um, uh, sort of transients all over the network. But our approach for sensing does not rely on detecting those transients. So we are kind of immune there. Uh, but for water, we have to take into account. Fortunately, I mean, again, this is empirical uh, thing. Why, sort of at least our experiments on vibration propagation show that it's a relatively simple structure underlying this. That is, you can act, actually model these things um, uh, as sort of a linear gain kind of thing. That is, vibration in one pipe segment basically multiplied by a gain induce an additive vibration on a neighboring pipe. Uh, pipe segment. So again, the problem here boils down to learning that coefficient in this case, which is between pipe I and pipe J. Do you do this essentially, or do you have to do it Our algorithms run centrally. <laughs> we collect the data and do it centrally. It's, it's, an optimization problem. it's an optimization problem. Yeah. Currently, we just feed it live to MATLAB and just do it there. So uh, that works fine for us. So basically, the crosstalk component you can model as a set of equations like this, where now we have a matrix corresponding to correlations between every i, j combinations there. And again, uh, sort of uh, our goal, uh, we have to additionally learn those propagation parameters. Now the problem becomes harder. So if you throw in these additional constraints into the uh, optimization problem, what we have is a signal programming problem. And unfortunately, with the presence of these kind of constraints, this is an NP-hard problem. So here what we did was we sort of resorted to a constraint relaxation. And the idea being that there are other sources of vibration that also sort of kick into place. So we kind of convert this uh, equality uh, into a more relaxed constraint, which yeah, so we transform that into an expression like this, where we're basically saying that the summation is going to be less than equal to what we are kind of measuring, and the measuring part also now includes some of these unmodeled effects which are out there. And with this relaxation of the constraint, it actually becomes a solvable problem. It's a linear uh, mixed linear geometric programming problem, again efficiently solvable, and. Uh, Sort of standard textbook stuff there. Okay, so uh, that was on the water side. Electrical side, like I said, is simpler. There is no crosstalk, so you can basically apply the first part, namely uh, the linear programming approach there, and it kind of works fine. So um, what uh, I have now are sort of some case studies that we did. Um, so a bunch of scenarios, uh, some in my students' apartment, some at my house. Uh, PC, fridge, table lamp combination, PC, fridge, table lamp, an uninstrumented alarm clock, uh, router, home router, a set top box, couple of laptops, massage chairs, stuff like that in case three, a simple kind of water network in case four. And the results have been pretty, pretty good, um, not something that we had expected going in. So this is the case one. Um, so again, we are capturing the ground truth so that we are able to sort of uh, compare against these things. And what you see out here on the left-hand side, bottom side, is the estimated appliance power using this whole optimization-based approach. On the right-hand side, you see the true appliance, true at least as measured by those plug-in kind of sensors we bought. And at least visually, I'll show you the numbers later, but visually you see that there's a very nice correspondence. I mean, pretty much kind of the right thing which is happening. Yeah, so we always have problem with the transients, okay? Uh, but fortunately, by definition, they are transients. 
So, in, at least in terms of your accumulated energy or accumulated water, they don't matter. Uh, but if you are looking to do something with that temporal evolution, then we obviously. Captured some of the we captured some, we dent some. Uh, thing is, uh, it, uh, most of these sensors have transient times to react to these things. So, uh, that's, but uh, <coughs> I guess the way I kind of looked at it is, um, as long as we can get into enough temporal granularity that I can identify which activity it was and how much I consumed, I am ok. I do not want to kind of see anything finer within that at least. That is sort of the goal that we started out with. And if you sort of, uh, okay. so here you kind of see for the same numbers um, what the error characteristics was. Main thing you look on the right hand side, the energy consumption. Yep basically pretty pretty good um, uh, with this and sort of with a much cheaper but certainly more compute intensive solution. Case 2, uh, this was a more complicated scenario and uh, again you kind of see, so we failed to capture the transient again, this is a true power, sort of our estimate did not sort of show that, but then its overall accuracy actually again at least visually and we start to trust does they match pretty, pretty well. Uh, case 3, which was the most complicated, lot of stuff happening. Uh, here we actually do show you the percentage numbers. So you will see sort of we are within plus minus 7 percent and that happens in one light and one laptop. Most of the other times we are actually pretty good. Uh, certainly enough for the goal that we started out with, which is efficacy of these measurements and kind of providing that personal insight. Okay, So, it is not something which will pass any kind of if you are trying to meter and pay people, uh, have people pay based upon this consumption, this is not for that, but this is close enough. Please. These were either incandescent or halogen lamps. Okay. Yeah. And we were detecting them using the light sensor. Yeah. And the, the true power is through. Okay, this is the water case. Uh, so, for water, uh, the results I am reporting are from sort of a test bed thing that we just created in our lab with different kind of pipes and all. Uh, but we have similar numbers for apartment and residential settings also. Um, so, uh, this is with PVC, and what you see here is uh, true and estimated kind of overlaid. And Yes, our estimated has a lot more jumpiness to it, but it is basically tracking it very nicely. Our error is um, sort of plus minus 10 percent, well within that range. I mean, uh, the actual absolute value is a lot, lot less. Please go ahead. Have you considered using some kind of curve smoothing algorithm? We have not. So, this is just the plain output of our uh, raw data fed in and into that optimization thing. So, no, we have not, and clearly these are things that we will have to. The transients are not, yeah, uh, I mean those are, also also the other thing is we sort of also, I will talk about later, we try to detect when we need to recalibrate, uh, if things are off, either because the characteristic of the appliance changed or faucet, someone replaced the faucet by a different low flow faucet, what not, so, so we have to kind of detect also, so you do not want to probably excessively smooth, you sort of do want to make sure that. Exactly. So, so you are right. And so, again, this is certainly not, where, uh, this is not going to be for metering purposes, okay, where money corresponds to what is happening, okay, it is not for that. Um, accumulated pipe uh, water usage is another way of looking at it, and again, uh, very close to the ground truth in our case. Um, two pipe case. Uh, Again, so what you see is the measured vibration and the true flow rate um, and kind of the estimated flow rate and they are sort of tracking pretty nicely. You see the regions where we are kind of off here, there. One of the places that we run into trouble also is when it is in excessive uh, relatively low flow conditions. Our A to D converter is a uniform, uh, is allocating the bits uniformly. So, our error rate goes up when we are measuring small signals. If, uh, we had a non-uniform sampler, we would be able to do better there, please. Like the uh, we can, we are not able to detect leaks, they are too low for our yeah. central meter to detect, but we can detect its effect over, oh, its accumulated thing over time, okay. But uh, so, sort of little, little leaks, 
is not something that we are able to detect yet. Uh, so, okay, so uh, for, we have not subjected it to those kind of deliberate, uh, if you may, noise being injected into the uh, channel. But some of these things, and I'll talk about a little bit later, I mean, uh, they would fall into the general category of the various kind of faults and failures that we need to be robust to. And sort of in other contexts, we've been doing a lot of work in that space. Some of these things are, can be handled, some of them can be. So. And again, our sort of uh, flow rate estimation is uh, pretty good. Uh, what you see out here is uh, the true on the bottom side, separate for two pipes, uh, and the estimated one. And again, kind of the error characteristics are pretty good. Now, where we fail are very low flow conditions. Um, uh, so you see kind of uh, the error is sort of not particularly good uh, in the beginning part, and that's simply because we have a slow flow condition here, fast flow here. This is where uh, basically we run into the bit resolution, not having enough bits to resolve that signal. So that's the A to D converted part of it. Okay, so uh, going back to sort of this issue that sort of faults, failures happen, or there are changes in the st structure which affects uh, the calibration that we have learned. So we need to be able to detect it and kind of react to that. So what we do is we keep track of kind of a performance metric of sort, if you may, which is uh, sum of estimates minus what our meter is telling us uh, and kind of a relative value of that. And what we then do is we kind of keep uh, track of that and then sort of when we recalibrate, uh, we hope to improve that. So what you see out here is uh, at this point, which is around 150, we kind of recalibrated and our quality uh, of estimate sort of improved quite a bit. So the idea is we basically keep track of this metric if it begins to get worse, which basically means our calibration parameters are no longer working. That is, our sensors are telling us I'm consuming more or less than what my meter is, then we just go through a recalibration phase at that way. Okay, so um, uh, what next? So I mean, this, this at least at these scales, this technology sort of um, works rather well. Um, at least uh, the results are pretty promising. Uh, so next direction that we are going into is um, sort of moving beyond just endpoint level uh, disaggregation uh, to really start saying who consumed it kind of thing. And the uh, reason simply being that human behavior uh, basically plays probably even a bigger role uh, or as important a role in sort of energy consumption and water consumption than the sheer technology underlying that building. And lots of studies have basically sort of made this point that uh, providing individuals with uh, continual feedback about what they are consuming uh, sort of improves, uh, make, makes their habits more efficient. I mean, in case of cars, the so-called Prius effect that some of the studies have pointed out because it kind of shows your real-time fuel efficiency kind of on the time and uh, that has uh, people have demonstrated that it has had a um, beneficial effect. But in other contexts, going back, I mean, a uh, lot of utilities and researchers have done studies where using cameras and surveys and all, they kind of get, get out this kind of effect. And uh, you would see this general thrust that there are advantages to self-monitoring, that uh, it needs to be high frequency and uh, that uh, it really complements incentives. So uh, incentives is traditionally how utilities kind of do it, replace your toilet with a more efficient one and we'll give you a couple of hundred dollars back kind of thing. But um, uh, information is the other part of thing. Uh, at the faculty summit, I sort of heard this other term, water footprint uh, being talked by some, some people, carbon footprint, there sort of a lot of people do already talk about it. So this. This notion that providing me with feedback on how I am doing kind of will positively affect my behavior is something that at least uh, a lot of people believe in. No one has done kind of a large scale study where it would be kind of easily deployable and also that's one of the things that we working with our residence halls, I'm going to talk about that, we sort of are headed towards doing. So what uh, we want to do is now, out of this scope, we want to provide you not just 
this faucet consume this or television consume this, but rather whatever person A in the household uh, was responsible for this amount of the TV running and by the way this amount of wastage because he turned it on and left the room those kind of things. So, that level of dis uh, disaggregation we want to break. So, what we did was sometime last year we kind of did a uh, crude kind of run of this in an apartment. Uh, so, when I say crude because at that time we did not have the rest of our indirect sensing stuff and all. So, we actually had direct sensors every place and also for monitoring who was using what our approach was uh, we basically had an active tag on everyone uh, this was household of two um, and uh, we defined notion of using an appliance by kind of a use range associated with the appliance. So, if oven is running and you are within its use range which we kind of define at an intuitive level then we kind of allocate it to you. For every class of appli appliance we also had different models some appliances are shareable some are not. If television running there are multiple people then we accounted for all of them there whereas uh, some of these things are uh, clearly assignable just to one person. So, we kind of take those into account. So, uh, what came out of that kind of system or that, that, that initial sort of uh, prototype what it generates are these kind of reports where now not only we are showing uh, how much power is being consumed by TV or living room lamp and stuff like that, but we are also constantly assigning it to different users in this case just two users okay. and in some cases you see there were uh, so living room lamp there were two people in the room. So, we did a 50 50 allocation then user 201 left. So, all the assignment went to just one of the users and then we kind of aggregate those uh, you see in this case user 201 consumes a lot more energy, but that is mostly because um, uh, that was a spouse living at home whereas other person worked. So, sort of energy usage was different. Um, now, sort of this kind of thing couple of things that sort of so part of it was a sensing part which we have sort of hopefully uh, made a big step towards with our indirect sensing approach. The other part is that this whole notion of like oh I have to carry this tag for the system to detect where I am. So, one what we are pursuing now with uh, actually my former student Andreas at Yale's uh, which is uh, using indirect sensing there as well. So, there as we cross the threshold of our houses usually we have cell phones and all. So, the system has some places where it knows who was there and the identity and then subsequently uh, if we can track this person using motion sensors triggering or kind of uh, at door thresholds what was the height of the person going through this kind of indirect sensing our hope or at least dream is that could we detect at least in a with reasonable statistical accuracy uh, who was in what room or what area okay and without requiring anyone to carry anything special. Uh, do not know whether we will succeed in that or not, but that is something that we are sort of trying to do. The other direction we are taking is uh, energy competition. So, this is what I refer to working with the residence hall uh, at UCLA. Uh, so, these are multi tenant buildings where essentially you, you are not being charged for electricity or water usage and currently the system has no way of knowing who consumed what. Uh, so, what a lot of universities are trying to do is to really pitch these students into competitions against each other. Um, uh, this couple of studies that uh, so one at New Hampshire they kind of did a uh, ran a competition sort of uh, in a very crude form and they showed something. Oberlin actually has a very nice system if you go to this uh, their website uh, the URL which is out there for their various dorms they kind of show a continuous live display of electricity by the dorms. You can also do it by the floors which kind of gives you a per person thing. So, you can see these competitions right I mean these guys are less efficient than let us say some someone like this they give a per person thing. Um, but what these guys want to go towards is really a finer granularity because currently what they do is they kind of tap it at the electrical panel level. So, whatever circuit they are seeing and typically a circuit corresponds to a uh, couple of floors okay. I mean at least in the UCLA residence buildings that is kind of the structure. Uh, so, that is the granularity they are stuck with and they really want to move this thing to kind of a room level thing where outside your room or perhaps a suite of room there is an indicator of the greenness of that thing and kind of get the students into this sort of competition. Uh, part of it is I guess obviously the behavioral scientist type trying to figure out what works what does not, but uh, part of it is also concrete economic savings which sort of some of these studies do suggest. 
And in this particular case, uh, high temporal and sp spatial resolution sort of does become important. There are some solid studies, again, kind of going back some years, which show that sub-metering in multi-tenant housing does result in more energy saving as opposed to kind of aggregate things. So this is something from New York, which basically said in multifamily buildings, anywhere from 10 to 25 percent reduction via submetering. Uh, this is from uh, national housing, something, uh, one of the national agencies. And they basically compared uh, sort of uh, submetering against uh, sort of divvying, divvying up the bill equally kind of thing. And again, sort of submetering does seem to uh, result in more saving. So that's, that's kind of the direction that we are sort of going in with this technology. Another item which sort of comes up, so uh, again at uh, UCLA some of our residence halls are like 50 years old and some of them are within the past 10 years. So their infrastructure quality is very different and in particular um, uh, with, uh, sort of when it comes to where to invest in terms of improvement, what are what is broken, insulation problems, those kind of things. So one of the things we hope also is that with the same infrastructure with some additional sensing modalities thrown in, can we start detecting like uh, airflow and the duct is no longer good or there's an insulation problem or there's a broken window and those kind of things. So the idea being that in addition if we kind of also given that we have the sensors already out there, if we also combine it with some obvious forms of environmental data, then uh, we can, in addition to resource accounting, we can also sort of start um, providing uh, or start detecting uh, failures or operational faults occurring in the infrastructure itself. So that's another direction sort of that we are headed to. Um, so eventually kind of uh, the lot of missing pieces that we have in this overall picture, we don't yet have the activity detection stuff, although sort of Andreas has been doing a lot of work in that space. We hope to sort of combine these things. Um, uh, we uh, also do, would like to do this fault detection. Uh, I guess the whole issue of visualization and all is biggie. Currently we have sort of relatively uh, simplistic hacked up interfaces to that. So some other, I guess, closing remarks, uh, deployment issues, I think it's a big one for this. So even though we have made it a lot simpler than kind of calling an electrician or plumber to install, there are still issues in the sense that some of these sensors have directionality requirements so they need to be attached carefully. So sort of uh, we are basically working on kind of a deployment assistant of form uh, there. And the other related thing is that some of for any given thing, some sensing modalities are more tolerant of sloppy deployment and some are not. And perhaps there are other signatures that uh, could help us there. So, so that's another direction that we are uh, detecting sensor problems, accidental displacement, um, pets, humans, whatever, displacing the sensors, those kind of things. So generic kind of detecting faults and failures in our sensing infrastructure itself. Um, I have been collecting sort of, we've been collecting data from uh, my house and some grad students and uh, the one second resolution water and electricity usage reveals a lot about one's life. And uh, so that's, uh, so I guess part of it is when this kind of data goes to utilities, which some of them are trying to, I mean, I think it's a cause of concern. But for our case, I mean, it's actually a good and bad because it means that we can actually detect a lot of human activity and therefore assign per person allocation from the very sensors we are using to measure the resources themselves. Okay, so uh, and particularly given some prior knowledge like this is the kids room, this is the couples rooms, those kind of things we can certainly bring that into play. Um, so this work sort of uh, some of it is coming in a, a, a upcoming Ubicom, some of it was in census in November and uh, uh, thanks to our funding agency, in this case a little bit of money from NSF who has been helping us on this. So anyway, I'll sort of stop here and any questions, comments? So what do you think of the cost if you commercialize this? Cost compared with value and also... Uh, so, okay. okay, so the bill of material cost for the sensors we are using is like 30, 40 bucks. Uh, for a package, right? Because we are using light, sound, and uh, so these are very relatively simple sensors. Uh, installation should be relatively straightforward, but obviously I come from academics, I'm 
missing a lot of things. The other thing is the cost of the whole software environment around it and all visualization tools and all and I have no idea on that. But in terms of the bill of materials, we are way ahead. Yeah, so uh, this, so uh, the costliest one from that perspective, costliest in the sense that most intensive is our pipe vibration one because we are actually kind of collecting all the data there. The others, uh, we actually can do local thresholding and all and be done with it. For the vibration one, we have been looking into this compressive sampling. I don't know if any of you have followed that work, but this is you can do much less than sub Nyquist, uh, much less than Nyquist rate sampling and still be able to make inferences. Some of our initial results look very promising. That will buy us maybe 5 to 10x there, but still not quite there because uh, so the other things we have talked about is maybe the thing goes into kind of a mode where once there is an onrush of water, we kind of start sampling high, so adaptive sampling kind of techniques. I mean, we are able to last a few months right now on the AA batteries on these sensors. We are using just off the shelf stuff. I think if we optimize them, we can uh, uh, certainly, I mean, if I, if I were to go by the data from people who have done longer term deployments and all, I think we should be able to hit a couple of years kind of time frame with these optimizations, which we haven't done yet. <laughs> We, I, I, I uh, yeah, we do, and uh, uh, which is why I guess I mean the real deployment we are going with is uh, uh, with the residence hall people because they are hard nosed about money, and we'll see how it goes. They were actually seriously considering doing that thousand dollar plus metering, so they believe that they have enough fat in there. Currently, what's happening is so they have done some manual studies. Um, as well, and it, they do suggest uh, significant waste uh, wastage being done by the students. Okay, unconsciously, uh, in the sense that it's just like leaving things running, you know, those kind of things. So, so their belief is yes. Uh, the other thing is, I guess we are viewing this thing less as a permanent installation and more as a uh, audit kit, which we can go and install in a residence hall for a month or two and then move elsewhere. So that's kind of the model that we are. There is an industry out there currently which does water audits and all for you, but they charge a lot and they use pretty expensive sensing modalities and they still do not get your day-to-day -day kind of life usage because they come with kind of rather ugly sensors and recall these things and all. So I think, I mean, in terms of business models, probably that, that market would be the first one to go after as opposed to really an end user kit. Either. The learning curve is how, about how, for example, consumer, how do I know how long it will take? How do I know believe your accuracy? For example, for this period, I know your device is learning right now. I don't have, I don't have to trust it. So, right, yeah, uh, uh, I bought this device, for example, and then I don't know when is accurate, when is not. I don't know how many days it would take. Uh, I, 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 we don't have any, we don't have any data on that. And the other thing, which actually I didn't mention, I mean, we do think that some feedback from the user would go a long way to help us. Okay, so even simple things like, I mean, if you just provide like a wireless button there, like whenever you're going there, just hit it. Okay, and in case of, um, I mean, again, we expect that with the students and all, it would probably work out fine because some of the manual studies which have been done there the students take these timers into the shower and time them and stuff like that. So uh, I guess, uh, but in a, in a home setting, uh, one thing that we anticipate is at the end of the day or month or whatever, when you go back, maybe the user can provide corrections to it and that we take into account. So I think, I think the user feedback would be a critical component. We don't have enough usage data right now to even speculate on that because currently the users have been my family and some of my grad students' family, so we don't really have an unbiased user body yet. So. Well, thank, thank you.